All right, I think we will go ahead and get started with some introductions. First and foremost, my name is Nancy Gibson. Um, I'm a Senior Associate Director of Admissions at Denison. I've actually been at Denison now, I'm starting my 24th year, so a long time. I'm also a Denison parent, so my daughter Vanessa graduated from Denison in 2017. Um, so I'm so glad to be able to be with all of you tonight. Um, I'm gonna kind of serve as your moderator as we go through um, this webinar on academics at Denison. Um, but to start with, um, I do want to just give you a little bit of information and then we'll jump into some introductions here. Um, the Q&A button is the place where you should go uh, if you have some questions for us. We are going to have some time at the end to be able to answer uh, your questions. So feel free to put any questions in the Q&A. Um, and then um, we certainly will try and get to as many questions as we possibly can as we go along. Um, I'm going to have all of our uh, panelists introduce themselves, so I'm going to start off with Karen. Hi everyone, I'm Karen Spearling. I'm a professor in the history department. Um, I'm starting my 11th year at Denison, and right now I'm also the director of our new global commerce program, which is one of the new majors on campus. Um, we're just starting our fifth year of classes with that major. So I'm glad to be here. Fantastic. I'll turn it over to Dave. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dave Goodwin. I teach in the geoscience department and I've been here at Denison for I think this is my 18th year. So um, not quite to Nancy's um, status yet. Um, I also am a Denison parent. I, I just realized when you said that, I was like, I get to claim that now because my one of my daughters is a, is a first year student here. So um, for what it's worth, I feel really comfortable sending my own kid here. So. Exactly. <laughs> Great. We're going to turn it over to Kathy. Hi, everyone. My name is Kathy Dollard, and I am the Associate Provost for Academic Affairs. I am in my 24th year at Denison. I'm also a member of the History Department, along with Karen, um, member of the class of 1988. Uh, so I've got a long standing history with the place, and I'm, I'm happy to join you tonight. Fantastic. Thank you. Over to Sawyer. Hey everyone, uh, I, my name is Sawyer. Um, I'm a uh, junior at Denison currently, and uh, I'm a geoscience major. Where are you from, Sawyer? I'm from Minnesota. <laughs> awesome, thank you. And over to Joanne. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Joanne. I am a current senior, and I'm studying global commerce with a focus in East Asia, and I'm actually minoring in economics. And I'm from Los Angeles. So that's actually where I am right now, taking classes remotely. Fantastic. Well, thanks again to all of you for joining us this evening. Um, I am gonna go ahead and get things uh, turned over now at this time to Kathy Dollard. And don't forget, if you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A. Take it away, Kathy. Thank you, Nancy. So um, in the provost office, uh, we have oversight for the full academic realm of the college. That's a lot of fun because we get to work with new curriculum. We get to work with departments as they think about ways to innovate on uh, their academic offerings. Denison is a place, I mean, if you're here and you're interested in Denison, uh, you probably have a sense of uh, the liberal arts tradition. And Denison is a place that is uh, a longstanding practitioner of, of the liberal arts and we're really successful at it and uh, we're really proud of our liberal arts traditions. The, the core of what we do at Denison stems from our mission and our mission is that our students are going to become active citizens, discerning moral agents and autonomous thinkers. And you can see that really throughout our curriculum. In our traditional areas like physics, history, of course, I'm a big booster of history, philosophy, French music, kind of across uh, the liberal arts, our faculty emphasize really intensive engagement with students and building relationships with students throughout the curriculum. At the same time, we've also been able in the last several years to develop uh, some new curricular programs. And that's been, I think, a really important part of Denison's uh, history in the last several years. I think prior to 2015, the last time Denison introduced a new academic program was in the mid-1990s. 
Since then, we have introduced three new majors, uh, a variation on an old major, so really four new majors, uh, several concentrations. Uh, some of the exciting new things that are going on at Denison, Karen had mentioned that we have a global commerce program. We have a major in data analytics. Uh, we are introducing a major in global health, which um, is uh, going to be finalized and, and uh, part of our curriculum this year. Uh, we have a program in financial economics, health exercise and sports studies, and then we have some concentrations in a few other areas, including narrative journalism. All of these things are new, passed since 2015. But the important thing that we're very proud of is that every one of those new curricula are built upon the longstanding majors that I mentioned earlier. 80% or so of, of the curriculum in each of those programs was derived from things that Denison already does and does very well. So we, we strongly believe that you can come to Denison and you can major in anything and, and go on and thrive in whatever you choose as your vocation, both our traditional programs and our uh, new programs. And so when students come to Denison, they have a lot of choice. Some of those new majors I mentioned, they're fairly large. Uh, so, so what one of the attractive parts of them is that you get to, you are exposed to a number of other fields while you explore, for example, the global commerce major. You're also gonna be taking a lot of modern language. You're gonna be taking some history. You're gonna be taking uh, literature and other courses. And so there's plenty of opportunity through our general education package as well, in which students uh, take a range of courses in the sciences and fine arts to be introduced to um, new experiences, but also to gain depth and, and uh, expertise in the things that, that you're already interested in. So one little note that I want to provide before we get to our panel, because they're the folks you really need to hear from, but um, I am an alum graduated in 1988 with a history major. And then eventually I went on and got a history PhD. So that seems like a very sort of uh, uh, clear path. But with my Denison history major back in the 1980s, my first job was actually consulting to the electric utility industry through with uh, Ernst & Young and their management consulting division. They hired me back then because of writing skills, oral communication skills. Um, these are all competencies that have been part of Denison's education back then in, in, at the dawn of time when I was a student and are very much part of it now. And that, that sort of um, ability to move into fields that extend well beyond what one studies is uh, something that, again, we're very proud of. And I, I think our folks on the panel are going to be able to share with you how that actually works in practice. And so I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague, Karen Spearling. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so the four of us are, are here because we are, we're excited about many things um, about our Denison experience as faculty and students. And we just, we're, wanted to have some conversation and share some of that with you. And then we'll save plenty of time at the end for questions. So if you think of questions as we go along, please just go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Um, and Nancy will make sure that we get to as many of those as we can at the end. Um, so one of the things that, that is maybe a little bit unusual about Denison is that all of the faculty here are also advisors to students. We don't have a, a separate advising office where students go um, when they're thinking about planning their courses or their sort of overall college careers. Um, and as advisors, we spend a lot of time talking with first year students about their transition to college. I know um, many of you in the audience are high school students right now and maybe thinking about how college is gonna be the same or different as high school and, and um, how you can feel prepared for this. So as we were all thinking about things that, that would be helpful to talk about, um, Sawyer, I wanted to turn to you first. And I know you're, you're a junior now, so this is kind of a little distant in the past already, but what are some of the things that really stick out to you about how you navigated that transition from being a high school student to being a college student at Denison. Yeah, so I think that um, you know it's very common to experience a few different you know obstacles when you're when you're moving from high school to college. 
Um, and I know my freshman year, I definitely um, dealt with a few, you know, I think the main ones um, being just adjusting to a new workload and, you know, learning um, new study habits um, that I hadn't really had to learn in high school, honestly. Um, and so, you know, I found a lot of different things useful. Um, one thing I actually did was I signed up for an advising circle uh, my freshman year. And I actually found that to be a really positive experience. Um, I was able to kind of uh, develop a relationship with my advisor who I had known from the advising circle throughout that semester. Um, and, you know, he kind of helped guide me in those in that first semester or two before I declared my major. Um, and in the class, we also kind of just learned about you know, different resources and opportunities that are available on campus, such as the writing center or drop-in tutoring and things like that. Um, and then I think the other thing which I found most helpful um, was going to office hours and uh, developing a relationship with some of the uh, professors um, whose classes I was taking. Um, you know, often freshman year, I remember, you know, several times not doing so well on a test, you know, or just not doing as well as I'd hoped and uh, going into office hours and, you know, even just asking the professor, you know, what would you do if you were in my position, you know, how can I better approach this material and how can I become a better student and, you know, study more effectively for this class, so. Yeah, that's one of the things I, um, I, I always, love to talk with my first year students about the kind of persuading them about the importance of coming to office hours and the fact that that's what we're here for, right? That we, we like it when students can come in and spend some time with us one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and it's not only a time to come in and talk about things that you're struggling with in class, right? But I'm sure Dave, you probably have lots of stories about talking with students just when they kind of stop by and have questions about things that are on their mind. Yeah, I remember, you know, Sawyer coming in and saying like, I didn't do very well on this test. And um, no, I'm just kidding. Sawyer always did great in my classes. Um, I think the idea, I mean, I'm really glad that we started on this idea of, of um, well, at least we touched on the relationships with us. I, I think one of the things that sets this school apart is um, we actually, I think we, we sort of thrive on dealing with students. I think a lot of other professors, at least colleagues that I have at other schools, they sort of tolerate students. And I think for a bunch of us, we're here because we want to deal with students. And um, that's really one of the things that gives me energy, at least. And I'm sure, Karen, you have the same kinds of experiences that, you know, some kid comes in and they just turn you on for the day when they say something and they get excited about some of the material we were talking about in class. Um, yeah, I, I really do like that part of the job a lot. I, Joanne, I see you nodding your head. Does it feel that way from the student side also? Yes, so I, well, I mean, I was, so coming from high school, my high school was pretty big. I think they were close to like 4,000 students. And so I remember like one of the things that really drew me to Denison was like this liberal arts, like smaller place, like having that sort of relationship with professors and I just remember my freshman year like always hearing go to office hours and I think initially I thought of it as a very intimidating idea as well like you know I need to go I have to be very like polished I need to have good questions and I think it took me a semester and a little bit of time to realize like it's it's really just about like having a conversation and I know with like Dr. Spearling I've talked to you about like the things that we've learned in class, but I've also talked to you about like my future plans of like, you know, maybe I want to go to grad school, maybe I want to do something else. So I've kind of been able to touch upon like all of these different subjects. And it really was something that I think it took a little bit of getting used to realizing office hours isn't something that's intimidating. And it's not like, I have to approach it like these are my professors and it's like this sort of hierarchy, but it's like, no, they're just really there to teach and learn from each other and things like that so and so I guess going with that um I've taken a couple classes with Dr. Spearling as well like the global commerce as a global commerce major um, I've taken like the global focus proposal and like right now I'm taking the senior seminar with you so can you talk a little bit about like as a professor, your classroom teaching experience and like kind of what you try to do? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the way that I think about teaching in the classroom is, is 
similar to what Dave was saying about office hours. What I'm most excited about in the classroom is engaging with students and not, not just um, providing information, but really exchanging ideas and learning from each other. So across the board at, at all levels of my classes, often at the beginning of class, I'll start with a pretty wide open question about what did, what did students learn? from the material um, or from what they were reading that day. And, th and then there's a direction that, you know, I, I have plans for where we're gonna go for the day. Um, but I like to start with that, that sort of open-ended question um, to give everyone a chance to sort of practice using their voice in class because the point is for all of us to be talking. Um, but also because I think in addition to understanding the material that we're discussing in whatever class it is, being able to articulate what you have learned out of something, being able to sort of read on your own and recognize what you are learning and think critically about it, that is part of what I want my students to carry on, right, past my classes and, and past Denison. Um, and so I have taught at bigger schools with much bigger classes where I spent a lot of time lecturing and tried to fit in a little bit of discussion here and there. One of the things I really have loved about teaching at Denison is that there are ways to mix it all together. So even if I need to lecture a little bit, it's still lots of kind of questions and answers along the way. Um, and really ultimately what, what I come at, you know, I often go into class with a plan of what I think we're gonna do. Um, and sometimes we come out and we've done something totally different. And those are actually often my best teaching days. The days when I was not really sure what was gonna happen and you just sort of leave space for students to engage with the material. And th that can be the really the most exciting moment, so. I don't know if it feels like that way on the other end in our global commerce capstones, but that's sort of what I'm going for. Yeah, no, I definitely feel that. And I always really appreciate, like, I know sometimes when we have readings, we, it'll be very open-ended questions, but sometimes it is things like, you know, with this pandemic going on, like I, I just remember one of our recent classes where there was kind of like, okay, what's creative ways or what's a way that we can talk about how how are you doing? Because it's so common to get like it, things like that, like those little conversational skills that I think is, it's really easy to overlook when you're like in a classroom academic setting, but those sorts of soft skills are so important as well. Like when you're in order to articulate like what you did learn and in order to articulate kind of your thoughts in general, I feel like those are the sorts of things that I've been able to learn throughout the like throughout the senior seminar class as well that I found really helpful. So I, I just wanted to, I mean, another perspective from a, a teacher here is, um, you know, when I, when I think about what my approach in the classroom is all about, um, I, I remember an interaction I had when I was a student and a, a professor once asked me the geology class. I, I like geology. So I, you know, all my stories are about geology, but he, this professor, he said, why are the Hawaiian islands a straight line? And I just, my hand shot up like a rocket because I knew the answer. And I was like, yeah, you know, the source of heat must have moved underneath the Hawaii. And my teacher, he looked at me and he kind of went, no, that's not right. And I completely just flubbed the answer because I was I was, didn't know what I was talking about. But then what he did is he turned to me and he said, but I really like how you're thinking about the problem. And so there was something about getting the answer wrong, but then being followed up immediately with this encouragement that was like how you're processing information was clearly valuable to this teacher. And that's the kind of thing that I want to do for my students. I really strive so that you know, a kid appreciates or feels appreciated that it's not about just getting the right answer the first time. It's about learning how to think about problems in complex ways. And for me, that's that's really what's so exciting about being in the classroom. Um, I, I'm mindful of time. So I, you know, we kind of wanted, you know, we talked about all these things we were gonna discuss. So I'm interested in hearing the students talk a little bit about how did you find your 
majors, you know, transitioning from high school to college, but then once you're here, how did you decide you found a passion? And why don't I start with uh, Joanne for this one? Yeah, so coming into Venice and like as a freshman, I was very undecided and I kind of went with what my parents had suggested. So I came in as an economics major and specifically financial, like I, I was doing the financial economics concentration and I took an accounting survey class and kind of decided, you know, maybe this really isn't for me. And at that point, this was like my sophomore year and I had taken like philosophy courses, East Asian courses, and I was interested in all of these different topics, but I wasn't sure if that was something that I wanted to major in. And so somehow I kind of stumbled across global commerce. And it, I think that's, it really appealed to me because I knew I wanted to study several different topics or wanted the chance to take like foreign language skills, like history courses and all these different disciplines while still having some sort of structure to it. And so I think that, that like the classes that I took while I was at Denison helped me guide or find the path to global commerce. And I was able to still continue taking my language courses, taking like economics, which I was interested in, just not at the, just not enough to major in it. And so, yeah, it, it was a lot of trial and error where I was taking several different courses and kind of figured it out along the way. And I was talking, I talked to a lot of professors as well while I was trying to figure out, figure it out while who are in the global commerce department of, you know, what, what is it like? Like what kind of courses does a major, have and you know right now I'm very happy with the decision that I made with global commerce so how about you sir yeah so for me um you know I I felt kind of similarly when I came into college um I wasn't totally sure what I wanted to major in um, I think when I applied to Denison I thought you know I might major in po political science or something um, and then by the time I got here, I just, you know, felt mostly undecided. Um, and I ended up taking a uh, geoscience course the first semester uh, that I was here. And I just ended up really liking it. I liked how, you know, I could see things and I could just understand the world around me a little bit better. And I found that it just brought together so many different things, which, which interested me. Um, and actually the professor of that, um, of that class that I took um, the first semester, um, he showed your, he, uh, he gave me the, the contact info of a, of a student who is a junior or a senior in the department. Um, and so I spoke to him once or twice and kind of, you know, was able to get a feel of, of what the work was like, you know, like what a career in geoscience might look like, you know, what the major was like overall. Um, and so I just kept taking classes. Um, and in my spring of my junior year, or sorry, my freshman year, um, I ended up applying to a couple of internships um, at na different national parks. Um, and I ended up getting one in Idaho and that was just like an amazing experience. Um, and so I ended up declaring my sophomore year. Um, but I just felt that having kind of professors to talk to about the courses and also being you know, pointed in the, in the right direction to another student um, to kind of get the information on what the major was like was really helpful in, in making my decision. So listening to both of you talk, I, um, it, my mind goes back to this idea of relationships that Kathy talked about and that Dave brought up. Um, and in, in finding your pathways through, a lot of that had to do with talking to other people and other students and, and faculty, right? Um, and as Dave was saying earlier, one of the things that really Dennis and faculty tend to be pretty passionate about is in relationships with students and, and with colleagues, but, but really getting to know people. Um, and there are lots of different ways we do that as mentors, as teachers in the classroom, as research advisors. Um, so Dave, I was wondering sir, if you could talk a little bit about that, the, the, the research and mentorship side of how we build relationships here. Sure. So. Um... It's important, I guess, to start by saying, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job of emphasizing the fact that, you know, we are teachers and we are passionate about teaching. Um, but it's also important to 
make everybody aware we are scholars as well, at least the faculty, so that um, our job is both to teach, but then also to be, you know, members of our intellectual communities beyond just the campus. Um, and that's actually a really stimulating thing for us as professionals to be, you know, still connected with our peers generating new ideas. But what's so neat and, and unique about this environment is that we get to do it with students. Um, you know, it sort of ties a bunch of things together. I, I think about like Joanne bringing up office hours earlier, you know, and students really appreciating the idea they get to come talk with us. If you go to a big school, um, and there's a lot of advantages of going to big schools, but one of the things that you can't do at a big school is you can't come and talk to the professors. You're gonna sit in a TA's um, discussion session. You're not gonna actually come in and talk with people like Karen or me just because you know, we have different priorities. Um, but here it's really for me about how can I combine my scholarship with teaching? And that's done through research. And so, I mean, it, Sawyer is one of my research students and he has, you know, really exemplified the, the, the role of a student doing scholarship, um, doing first class work that will be eventually published. You know, I can, I look at some of the things we're doing and I can already see manuscripts that, you know, they help me, they'll help Sawyer as he thinks about grad school or whatever he wants to do after school. Um, but really the way to, for me, what's so special about this job is combining my scholarship with my teaching. And that's just all about getting to know someone. You can't spend 10 weeks in a summer teaching and learning about new ideas without really getting to know your students. And I, for me, that's just, it's a real pleasure. Um, I don't know, Sawyer, do you, do you, is anything that I'm saying ringing true or? Yes, yes, definitely, yeah. Um, He's worth every penny. <laughs> um, yeah, I could kind of expand on the on the research a little bit um, as from the student perspective. Um, I just, uh, you know, I met uh, Dave my freshman year, uh, spring semester. I had my first class with him as, as part of the geology um, core required courses for the major. Um, and I really enjoyed it. But uh, then the next semester, the fall of my sophomore year, I ended up taking a class which was, um, you know, heavily related to his research and his research interests. And after just really enjoying the class, I uh, asked if he'd take me on as a uh, research student or, a, you know, summer for a summer research project. Um, and he said yes. And it's, it was, uh, you know, so last summer, we did uh, remote summer research. And I just, I learned some very valuable skills. And uh, it was actually a very enjoyable time as well. I had a lot of fun doing it. And uh, I think it'll just be a really great experience for me, so. It's all, you know, I also want to just point out that these are the kinds of things that when you do this job, as long as, you know, Karen and I and, and Kathy have been doing this, one of the greatest things is getting these phone calls from students who used to sit where Sawyer is, you know, and they, they call you up and they say, I'm getting married or I just had another kid. and. I just want to let you know, Dr. Goodwin, how special our time was together when we did research. And so there's this continuum of students rolling in, interacting with us while they're here, and then they go on to do great things and they still stay connected with us. And, you know, so really the relationships aren't things that are just when you're here. They're the kinds of moments, they're the kinds of interactions that just persist for a really long time. I think another thing that I, I love about um, working on research projects with students is that it's not, you know, I'm a historian. I'm not training all of my students to go out and be professional historians. Um, but when I work on them on, work with them on history research projects, we're really thinking about, again, about sort of thinking critically about information and texts and thinking about how to make an argument to a particular audience. Um, and I, I always think of one of my favorite senior or independent research experiences was meeting with a summer research student as he sort of worked his way through. He was looking at comparing the 12th century Renaissance in Europe to the 15th century, the 14th and 15th century Renaissance and reading all of these historians fighting with each other. And um, we were sitting in a coffee shop talking about what he'd been reading and he got this very 
worried sort of look on his face and he said, um, Dr. Spearling, I, I think they're wrong. And I was like, that's great. And he said, am I allowed to say that? And I said, well, can you explain to me why you think that? Um, and, and that whole, that was a whole like giant step for him in, in terms of thinking of himself as a scholar and thinker, right? That he wasn't just trying to figure out what other people already think about things, um, but that he could, he had sort of read enough and was informed enough to kind of claim a place um, in the discussion. And he has gone on to be a um, producer at a public radio station in Iowa. Um, and so that's, you know, a one, one direction that you go with a, with a history major. Um, but I agree that that's, you know, that is a, a, a relationship building moment. And it's also sort of a moment that pushed him to sort of the next step of figuring out um, what he wanted to do as he moved on. Um, so wh why don't I, I think we still have a few minutes left for conversation. I wanna turn it back to the students and at, on that point of kind of career exploration and thinking about next steps. Um, Joanne, you're, you're the senior here, um, so you're a little bit closer to that than Sawyer. So why don't we start with you and kind of where, where you are and how you feel um, Denison has helped prepare you for making those next decisions. Yeah, so I think that coming into Denison, I really tried to, not really knowing what I was doing, I would just hear a lot of people talk about the Knowlton Center. So I remember my freshman and sophomore year, I just kind of would kind of utilize what we have on campus, which was like making appointments with these career coaches and working on like my resume and things like that. And it wasn't until my junior year when I was able, when I did the internship abroad in Hong Kong, where I was kind of like, okay, you know, I can, I started to narrow down like maybe this is, it was in a wealth management company. So I started to narrow down maybe like I can be interested in something in banking. And this past summer, I discovered there was a JP Morgan like, like program, internship program that I applied to, which I had heard about through the Global Commerce sends out like their newsletters, I think every week or every other week. So that's kind of how I discovered it. And I saw that and I was able to get connected to a, this was as a junior, I was able to get connected to a current senior who had already gone through this program and was global commerce. And she was able to give me a lot of really useful insights on like what sort of questions I can anticipate, what the program is like. And even during my internship, cause she started working there as well. She was able to really like help connect me to other people she knew. And so, like that was a really good experience. My internship was virtual because of COVID, but I was able to get a full-time offer with that. And that was really nice. Since once I had that, I was able to think about if there was anything else I'd, I'd want to think about. So I having that job where I, having that job kind of like laid, like good to go, I was able to look at like other things. So right now, like I applied for a Fulbright and I mentioned before where I started thinking about is grad school something I want to do and I know a couple of weeks ago I was talking to Dr. Spearling and I was like I thought I had everything figured out and I thought you know now that I, now that I have a job like that's it but it was it's this idea that I through the classes and through the conversations I was having in like my different classes like especially my senior the senior seminar class it was, I was continually learning more and I was continually like changing my idea of like what I might wanna do. So I think that's something that I've really enjoyed because even though I am a senior, like I still don't have anything figured out as well. Like, yes, I have something to look forward to, but it doesn't mean that I can't still consider other options, which is really cool and really nice as well. Sawyer, where are you and your, your thinking about all this as a junior? 
Um, well, I feel that the, um, <clears throat> the summer research experience I had last um, summer with Dave was definitely very helpful for, for me to kind of figure out, you know, what am I interested in, you know, and even, you know, it, it, it's always been surprising to me how many, you know, subfields there are and like, you know, there's, there's very specific, you know, different programs you can pursue and everything. Um, so I feel, you know, that I've kind of got an idea of, you know, what's out there to pursue um, through that and also through some of the other classes in my department. Um, and I'm also, you know, currently I am considering, you know, possibly going on to grad school. Um, and so these experiences that I've had with uh, my professors, I've also, I did um, a couple of days of field work with another professor um, down in, um, in uh, Louisiana. And, um, you know, these experiences have just been really valuable to help me figure it out. So. I'm definitely still in the early stages of my planning, but um, you know, I'm, I'm getting there, so. Dave, I know that um, Kathy was talking about how things have changed in the last sort of five years, curricular, we have some new curricular developments and the ways that we talk about helping our students to kind of think about their future, I, I think also is different. Is that, are there, are there things you've noticed that have changed in the time you've been here? Yeah, I, um, when I first started, I didn't, I didn't really put a lot of time into thinking about how do we launch students beyond Denison. You know, it didn't, it didn't occur to me just as as one member of the faculty how important it is for students to feel like, yep, the education turns into something that's really valuable after college. Um, and, you know, it's really, it, it's something more than just, you know, can you find a job? And to me, the, the emphasis, I think Joanne said it really, really nicely. It's, there's this thing that is just the pleasure of finding things out. And what I've figured out about working here in the last five years is the ability to share that pleasure with students and then have them grab it and run with it themselves and be able to turn it into a successful career. It's just super rewarding to watch. Um, it, you know, I feel like I get paid for not really having a job. You know, this is, I'm one of those lucky people that I like this. Yes, I know, I know. But then I would do this if I didn't get paid, I guess. Is yeah. You get paid to grade. Yes, yes. <laughs> you get paid to grade. Well, that, um, I think that's a perfect note to wrap up this part of the conversation and um, pass it back to Nancy and see if we have some, some questions in the queue. Does anybody have any last comments that they wanted to make? All right, Nancy, what do you have for us? Yeah, so we've got, we've got quite a few questions. So um, the first question is, can you drop in to see professors or email them to find a mutually convenient time or do students have to adhere to office hours? Well, let's ask the students. What's your experience with that? I personally have found that most of my, you know, pretty much all of the professors I have had here actually have um, been incredibly flexible. And I've had a kind of packed schedule, you know, in terms of um, how much class time I have and when. And, you know, often I have had, you know, classes where I get the syllabus and I'm like, oh no, you know, they're office hours they're all during another class that I have, you know, every single week. Um, but I, you know, that has not been a barrier. You know, I have always had professors, you know, with a simple email and some times that you're available to meet. Um, I've always gotten a positive response, so. Excellent. Yes, yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty standard that we set, yeah, we I, have set office hours, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, I was gonna say like, I, I agree with that. And I know that like, when I'm on campus, it's just the, the set times are just kind of nice that I know if I go, if I want to see a professor at that time, 100% of the time, I know they'll be there, but I've never had a problem with finding time to, or like just dropping by and talking to them. The only exception would be like right now when things are a little different that normally for office hours, you, you do have to like generally make an appointment, but again, like I've never had a problem with finding time to talk to professors if it conflicts with my, my classes or other meetings like that. Great. 
Um, the next question is, there's an admission question that I'll, I'll leave to the end, but uh, there's another question, are, are, are there athletic programs? There absolutely are. And if so, how well do students balance that with academics? I would say they balance that with academics amazingly well. I think most of our student, we have a, uh, Kathy, can you tell me the percentage of our student body that are student athletes? I'm, I'm going to look at Nan. I think I think it's about like 35 to 40 percent. And yeah, then that play, that when you bring in the mural, yeah, when you bring yeah. it into yeah. programs, you know, it, it gets over half. It gets way up there. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's like 60 percent, like including the club and intramural sports mm -hmm. um, as well. But yeah, there's a lot of students that are involved in athletics. We are very successful. I mean, I think that's that's important to know. I just saw it flicker across the screen. Um, what separates Denison? A lot of things. I think a lot of us could could talk about that at length. But we we are very successful in our athletic programs and have really strong recruitment kind of across the board. We've gotten the all sports trophy for our conference more often than not, and in, in many years in a row. Um, so faculty really understand, and it's not just athletics. I think in the art. Arts. We have such vibrant engagement from our students, uh, a lot of service commitments. Faculty recognize that, that our students, that as Sawyer was saying, it, the students are busy um, and athletics is certainly a piece of that. Um, so there is strong partnership between the athletics and the academics. Our coaches are our faculty. And so um, certainly th th we all recognize and work together um, to support the athletic engagement. It's very successful. Yeah, I would say too that the, I have found that often students in season can do, will do much better in classes. There's something about the structure and the idea that coaches are our partners. Like Kathy said that, you know, they're, they're invested in their students being successful on the field or in the pool uh, or on the track and in the classroom. So um, it can actually, absolutely be done to be successful to play a sport and still to get your work done. Absolutely. Um, so the next question is pre-COVID-19, was everyone on campus or are there online classes as well? At pre-COVID-19, um, we did not have online classes and our campus is fully residential. So all students who are enrolled live on campus. Um, yeah, that's the short answer. And also everyone, we've got, is it about 1800 of our students that are back on campus and we're in person? So the next question is, what is the academic year like for sophomores, juniors? And is it true that at the end of your sophomore year that you have to declare your major or minor with what your major or minor is going to be? Students, do you wanna? Do you want to address this one? How would you describe your sophomore and junior years? Um, I guess I can touch upon this a little bit. I guess sophomore year was really just, I think freshman year, it was a lot of adjusting and kind of getting used to, uh, this is what college is like. And I think sophomore year is when I really started to get involved in different things like I, I mean, you can see my cello in the background, but like I was in getting involved in arts and I started joining like more clubs and like I was, I joined like the Denisonian, which is our school newspaper and like had an editor position, all these different things. So I think sophomore year for me was when I was kind of became more involved. Like once I kind of figured out my academics was, I kind of had that a little bit under control or like kind of knew what I was getting into that's when I could really focus on what sort of other extracurricular activities or if I wanted to work or if I wanted to, to do all of that, like what I wanted to do and had time for. And I mean, junior year, half of my junior year was spent abroad. So that was, I think that's a pretty big component of junior, for a lot of people's junior year. So it's kind of a time as well, like same thing, like going on that, thinking about future maybe, um, yeah. I could uh, probably just add something about um, having to declare your major. Um, I uh, actually know a couple of people, you know, I know a lot of people are kind of concerned about, you know, 
I'm going to have to, you know, decide what I want to do for the rest of my life, you know, only a year or a year and a half into my college career or whatever. Um, but I actually do have a couple of friends, you know, I have one friend now, he's a junior, um, and it's his fall of his junior year, and he just switched majors this semester, you know. Um, so it, it absolutely, you know, there is some flexibility. Um, it is possible to like change later if you need to. Um, but I also, you know, I think for many students, it's really not a problem. You know, a lot of people come in undecided and then you take a couple of classes in something you like and it's pretty easy to find a passion, I think, so. Oops. Great. Um, so the next question is how, when is a first year student matched with a faculty advisor? That, that initially that happens um, before you even get here, or, or I guess the, the, maybe the first time that you come um, at, at June orientation. Um, which is which is when first years register for their fall classes. So at June orientation, you'll have a faculty advisor, and then that may continue to be your advisor, or you may sign up for an advising circle, like Sawyer talked about, and then the faculty member who runs your advising circle will be your advisor. Um, and then ultimately, some students keep the same advisor for all four years, and some students, as they travel these paths that Joanne and Sawyer are talking about, um, find another advisor who maybe is in the major that they finally decide on. Or sometimes students will pick a, a, an advisor who is in their major, but then still keep their original advisor as a secondary advisor to maintain that relationship. Awesome. There is a question in here. I'm zipping through them and I just saw it. Um, so uh, there's a question for the students. What will Sawyer and Joanne miss most about Denison after they graduate and move on? The Either one of you, of course. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I would say, you know, without a doubt, the thing I will miss most is the relationships, you know, with fellow students, with faculty. Um, you know, and even with staff here at, here at Denison, um, you know, that's absolutely the strength of, of Denison. And, you know, to kind of move away from the main point, you know, the fully residential campus absolutely, you know, gives you a lot of opportunities you wouldn't have otherwise, so. And, yeah, and I, I guess adding on to that, I would say besides like the relationships, I think I'm also gonna really miss being in a space where I can really just focus on learning. I think that's something that, you know, being in especially residential area where everyone around you from like the students to the professors to the staff, it's, it really is about like, you know, we, you wanna keep growing. And I think that that sort of environment really does rub, rub off you. And it really like kind of inspires you as well. Like to, you wanna keep learning about more things. So I think that's something I'm really going to miss, like just sort of being in that environment and like feeding off of that sort of energy. Um, yeah, I miss that a lot. Awesome. I can come back and visit. <laughs> that's right. Come back. Um, so there is a question. Can I study a foreign language while I'm studying my major at Denison? Yep. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. All, all students, all Denison students are required to take um, two semesters at least of a foreign language and then beyond that you can minor or you could double major um, in the global commerce major and in the new global health major. There's a requirement that you continue through the intermediate level of language study. Um, so I think that there are many different ways many, that you can fold a foreign language into your other studies. There's a question um, just in, about academic support. Um, and the question was specifically about academic support or help for international students taking account into account their education may have been quite different, but maybe also just to talk about academic support in general as well. Sure, I think there are uh, two areas uh, of real strength. Our Office of International Student Service Services has in the last again four to five years uh, doubled uh, its staff. I think even tripled really because uh, there for a while there was a one person shop. But we've got we've got four professionals in the Office of International Student Services, 
And um, in part, that's because um, our proportion of international students has slightly grown, but, but the reality of just supporting our international students and um, working, we have a visa specialist, we have um, specialists in terms of uh, helping to develop the curriculum um, and curricular offerings, which is particularly important in this COVID era, thinking about ways that we can really um, enhance remote learning for international students who are um, overseas right now. Um, so there's a, a really strong international student services office. Along with that, um, partnering with that for international students, but for the full student body is our academic resource center. It goes by ARC um, and academic, they, the ARC team um, provides a range of support for students. Um, kind of some basic workshops, first years, just the transitional workshops, time management workshops. Um, they do a lot of individual appointments with students who are, are trying to negotiate uh, their path, making that transition from high school to college. Um, they also uh, provide support in terms of a, a really strong tutoring program and um, the, most departments have tutors and that uh, is run out of that area. And there's also a lot of intersection between the Academic Resource Center and, and back to the International Student Services area. There, there's a team that meets weekly that just coordinates and, and says, you know, where, where are there areas where we could be more robust in our offerings or, or um, what is undersubscribed, what is oversubscribed in terms of thinking about these sorts of workshops and support. So it's very responsive in the moment, I'd say, and uh, strong offices. I, I think, can I just add, I think this is another place where the, um, the relationships part is important that for, for all of our students, definitely including international students, there's always space to in the office hours or other outside of office hours to come and talk with professors about any challenges that you're facing within a particular class. And so that there's support there within classes as well as the broader institutional um, offices that, that are specifically about academic support. And I should add, I, I forgot a, an important element there. We also have a coordinator of multilingual learning who helps students, international students, negotiating that transition, both in terms of, of language skills and just enhancing English language skills, but also that cultural transition to the US higher ed system um, that, that plays an important role as well. Great, thank you. Um, for the students, um, how fast were you able to build relationships with fellow students? I, I mean, for me, and I know it happened pretty quickly. I, I know that one of my closest friends right now, we, we had met through one of our, like, I think in, in our first year, everyone's required to, required to take a writing 101 class. So I know for one of that, you know, I, I had a friend, I sat next to her and we kind of bonded over how much we didn't like the class. <laughs> And we kind of stayed <laughs> friends until this day. And so I, I think that like, just, you know, you, f you find ways to bond with people or even now, like th the people that I've met through like group projects and things like some, some of them I haven't talked to ever, but through the meetings that we have, like we kind of have that shared like goal that we're working towards. So it's gotten, it's, it's still possible to make friendships and like create relationships with people even now. So I, I can offer, uh, I guess, kind of a weird perspective here. Um, my daughter, you know, like the night before move in was like, oh, I'm so nervous. I don't know, you know, how am I going to manage this? And the next day um, I called her up and she's like, dad, I, I don't have time to talk with you. I got a meeting some friends over here and you're just like, yeah, it just happens. Now, that's just one person, but I, I think as a general rule, this is the kind of place where you're going to make a lot of connections, deep connections, and make them quickly. That's awesome. Um, there is a question in here about, um, and, I, and I think uh, Dr. Dollar had addressed this a little bit, but what separates Denison from similar, similar liberal arts colleges? Um, and so I didn't know if anybody else wanted to expand a little bit further on that. Well, so Joanne, did, were you gonna answer? Oh, you can go ahead. <laughs> 
I I think everything that Kathy said is is really important. Um, I would say, you know, in, in my experience, overall that that combination of being excited about having students who are excited about being in the classroom and also are excited about trying lots of different things and participating in life in many different ways and finding concrete ways to contribute to society. Um, and students who really want to listen to each other um, and, and learn about each other and, and make, make friends um, and learn about each other's backgrounds. I think that sort of that particular mix of um, being interested in learning and intellectual growth and also being interested in socializing and reaching out beyond campus, which is that's a challenge right now in COVID-19, um, but it's something that, that students are still working to find different ways to do. I, I think that is what really sets Denison apart in my experience is that it's the, really the whole package. Um, it's, it's not sort of just students who are interested in one particular thing come here, um, but students who really embody that idea of being well-rounded um, as people, as human beings. That's exactly, I, I think it's that well-roundedness. And then we also have the structures that support the well-roundedness. We talked about athletics. We mentioned the arts quickly, but Denison has both a dance and a cinema department. Some liberal arts colleges might have one or the other. It's, it's rare to have both. And Denison has really um, built itself in order to cater to support and um, help students flourish in this wide, wide arena of areas. So it's, it's not a niche college. Like we, we don't just produce poets, or, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a niche place. Um, it's, it's all of those things, nationally recognized undergrad research program. And uh, I think that continues to be core to our mission. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so as we are down to our last couple of minutes, um, does anyone anyone want to share uh, what their favorite thing is about Denison? Students, do you wanna go first? Not to put you on the spot. Um, I think my favorite thing about Denison has definitely just been the, um, the relationships with professors, honestly. I mean, um, the opportunities that I've been able to pers pursue, you know, I mean, it, it's not a super common that someone even like has an internship after their freshman year. But um, after speaking to my professor about it, you know, he definitely kind of encouraged me and, you know, gave me a lot of different options. And with the summer research, you know, I've kind of just been able to to get a just a really good idea of what's out there, um, you know, in terms of you know some you know something to do with my life that might interest me. Um, so I think that that's my favorite part about Denison. Oh, I would say my favorite part has been like kind of going off of their relationships, and I think I mentioned this as well, but like continually learning or like making these connections, I. I know that like even this semester, I think one of my favorite things is like, even though I take a bunch of different classes, like right now, like I have an economic justice class, I have an ethnic literature class, like the senior seminar. And like, even though there are like, one's a literature class, one's an economics class and one is a senior seminar, but I've still been able to find these connections like in what we're learning. And I think that's, I've really enjoyed that because it really shows me how it's not, it's really not like one dimensional, but you have to look at things from such a variety of different perspective from a different angle. And I think that being able to find those connections and talking about it with my professors, with my friends of like, oh, you know, this is something I learned in my ethnic literature class, but I think it really applies to what we're learning right now about like capitalism. Like, I think like that's super, super interesting. And yeah, that's kind of been my favorite part about Denison. <laughs> For me, it's um, 
it's the students, you know, it's the students in the classroom, it's the students in the lab. Um, there's always the bittersweet thing when they graduate, and, you know, you know, you're not going to have as much time with them. But then there's always another group of students who's waiting to come on in and that it's so it's exciting and um, it's just a fun thing to do. I mean, it's definitely the students for me. I think for me, it's the, the conversation similar to what Joanne is saying, the conversations with with students, with colleagues, um, faculty and staff that that can just jump from one thing to another. So we can be deep in a conversation about an academic subject and then suddenly that relates to current events and then suddenly we're talking about someone's personal experience. Um, I, I think that's that's not all that common in academia, especially across all these different groups of people. So that's something that I, I really value about working here. All of the above. I, I could say a lot more, but it's 801 and I, I think, uh, yeah. Fantastic. Well, I just can't thank you enough um, for joining us and to our panelists um, for spending time with us this evening. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. And hopefully it helped everyone get an opportunity to learn a little bit more about Denison and certainly academics at Denison. Your questions were fantastic. There were so many, we couldn't get to all of them. So thank you so much for, for posing your questions. You can always certainly reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, we'd be more than happy to answer those for you. You can find us all on the website. Um, but um, we do appreciate your time and, um, and you know taking the opportunity to learn more about what Denison has to offer. So we hope everyone has a great evening. Um, and um, again, certainly be in touch with us if you have any questions. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.